right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's uh, so good to be here with you today, and a special welcome to you as well if you're uh, watching online. If you do not know me, I just want to let you know my name is Nathan Drover, and I'm the lead pastor here of a team of pastors. And I am thankful to say that this is the last Sunday that you will be required to wear masks. So, woo, I know, it's so good. So good. That, that was all me too, so thanks for that applause. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's great. Uh, we're really looking forward to not having to wear masks, not having to distance and all of those things, uh, and getting to do a bit more uh, things together as a community. So, um, with that being said, though, for this Sunday now, we do ask that you continue to wear a mask during the whole service, and we thank you for doing that uh, one final time. Well, we've gathered here to worship God together, to honor him as our Lord and Savior. And um, the, the way that we're going to do that this morning is through singing songs, through uh, listening to God's word being preached, uh, through prayer and different things like that. And I want to set the, our worship in the context of God's heavenly worship that's happening uh, all the time, uh, forever and ever, from Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 to 11. So John is seeing this in a vision. It's a, it's a tearing back of the veil, so to speak, of seeing what's really true, what's really happening, as he is on the island of Patmos, um, what, what's really going on in heaven. And this is, this is part of the vision that he sees. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes, in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion. The second living creature, like an ox. The third living creature, with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature, like an eagle in flight. Very weird visions and, and things like that. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and the day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, which we just were told is all of the time, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. God is worthy of all honor, praise, and glory. So let's join those heavenly creatures in honoring God and worshiping him this morning. Let me open us up in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you now to give you glory, to give you power, honor, and our thanks. Uh, that you are Lord, that you created us, and that you now reign from your throne uh, in heaven. Father, please dwell with us this morning. In, meet with us and speak to us and touch us in whatever way um, we need, God. We know all of us come from different experiences, experiences in life, some of us from great weeks, others of us from challenging weeks. And so, God, we pray that you would bring your comfort for those who need to be comforted, uh, encouragement for those who need encouragement, and uh, challenge for those who need challenge. So, God, we pray uh, that you would be working this morning through everything that happens. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together to sing our first hymn.
Trinity. creation. 
creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. With wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath, and living water. Such a marvelous mystery. You can be seated. And I'm going to invite our kids to come up to the front. I think we have a couple, and I'm going to meet you down there. Oh, oh my goodness, they're all the way up on stage. <laughs> Are we going up here? All right, sure. <laughs> Just careful of the cords. That's the only thing. So we'll move these out of the way, but sure. All right, so I always have a question to start you guys off. My question today is, have you guys ever been asked to do something that you really didn't want to do? Yes. Yes, what was it? In truth or dare. Oh, truth or dare, like the game? Oh, yeah, that is a tricky game. I truth or dare, and it was, and I said dare. <laughs> she said, I dare you to eat poop. Well, that's good. <laughs> well, thank you for playing games with your sister, even though you didn't want to. <laughs> what about you, Charlie? Is there something you were asked to do that you really didn't want to do one day? Clean my room. Clean your... Clean my room. Oh, clean your room. Yes, I was going to say cleaning was on my list. Cleaning the dishes, specifically. That's what I don't like to do. So, today... <laughs> yeah. So in the fall, we're going to be talking a lot about a guy named Moses. And God asked Moses to do something he really didn't want to do. So in the book of Exodus, we learn that God's people called the Israelites, they're in Egypt and they are slaves in Egypt. So they're suffering and they're not very happy, but God wants to save his people. So God talks to this guy named Moses through a burning bush, which is pretty cool. And God tells him that he chose Moses to go and talk to Pharaoh and save his people and bring the Israelites out of Egypt, which is pretty cool, right? God literally spoke through a burning bush and told Moses that he gets to save his people. What do you think he said? Did he say, yes, absolutely, or no? Thoughts? Maybe? What do you think he said? No. You no. think he said no? Xander, do you think he said yes? Yes. Oh. Okay, we have one of each. We think one says no, one says yes. The correct answer is Moses said no the first time. He was like, absolutely not, God. You have the wrong person. I am just a nobody. I cannot possibly go and save your people. So God promised Moses. He spoke to him a little more and said, I promise that I will be there with you the whole time. It doesn't matter if you're a nobody because I will be working through you the entire time. So after getting that comfort, what do you think Moses said? Yes. 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 Okay, we think he said yes. You know what he said? He said no again. And in fact, he said no two more times. He still said no. Why do you think Moses was saying no? No? Not sure? <laughs> was he maybe scared? Didn't want to. Didn't want to? Yeah, I, I don't think he wanted to do it at all. I think he was pretty nervous. And 
So God decided to prove to him that he could do it. So he did this really cool sign. He asked Moses to throw his staff down on the ground. And when he did, it turned into a snake. And then he told Moses to pick it up. And so when Moses picked up the snake, it turned back into a staff. Pretty cool, right? Now what do you think Moses said after seeing that cool thing? Okay, we have one yet? Yes! No. No? Oh, we have one of each again. And Charlie, you're right again. Moses still said no. He's like, God, no, I am not doing it. He's like, you've got the wrong person. I'm not good at speaking. I cannot possibly go and talk to Pharaoh. You're going to have to choose somebody else because I just can't do it. Now, God was getting a little bit angry by this point. And so, but God promises to help Moses. So he sends Moses, his brother Aaron, to do all the talking for him so Moses doesn't have to worry about that. And then what do you think Moses said? No. No? Oh, we have a vote for no. What do you think? No. No? Oh, (laughs) you know what? This time Moses finally did say yes. After all of that, how many no's was that? Like five no's? He was like, nope, nope. Okay, fine. I'll do it. That's 25 no's. That's a lot of no's, especially when you're talking to God. But finally, Moses did go to Egypt. He did talk to Pharaoh along with God's help and with his brother Aaron's help. And he brought the Israelites out of Egypt. And you know what? It was really hard and scary, like what Moses thought it would be. Pharaoh did not want to let his people go. And they had to wander in the desert for years. It was pretty rough. But it was also, I think, more amazing than Moses thought it would be. Because Moses got to see so many amazing things because he said yes. He got to see God part the Red Sea in two That would be like going down to the river downtown, and if it just, like, split in two, and you didn't have to use the bridge anymore, you could just walk through. Wouldn't that be pretty cool? Wait, wait, so it just split 25 meters? Yeah, I don't know. I think it would have been split pretty big, too, because all of the Israelites, all hundreds of them had to travel through it. Pretty cool, right? And then when they were wandering in the desert, God made bread fall down from the sky. They just had food falling out of the sky. Amazing, right? And Moses even got to see God himself. God tucked him into a little cliff and walked by so Moses could see him. But if Moses had never said yes, he wouldn't have gotten to see all of those amazing things. So sometimes God does ask us to do things that we really don't want to do or maybe things that make us really nervous or things that we're really sure that we can't possibly do. But he promises that he'll always be with us whenever we say yes. And if we say yes... We get to see so many amazing things. Do you know, I'm going to give you a real life example. Because about a year ago, just over a year ago, God was asking me to do something kind of scary. Do you know what he asked me to do? He asked me to move all the way from the other side of the country, all the way here, to this little town of Perth Andover that I'd never heard of before. And I didn't know what life was going to look like here. I didn't know if I was going to have a job or friends or what was going to happen. And it was kind of scary. But I knew God was calling me to. And so I said yes. And you know what? Life here has been much more amazing than any plan that I had for myself originally. I have get to be here with you guys, and I get to sing and play, and I have music students I get to work with and new friends, and it's been amazing. And I would have missed out on all of that if I said no to God. (laughs) We're getting a little tired. We better dance to get our energy back. So let's get everybody standing up. We're going to sing a song about giving our whole lives to God and how when we do, when we say yes to God, we get the greatest treasure in return, and that is God himself. Yeah. 
Good morning, everyone. Just a few announcements for this week. Uh, birthdays. Uh, Tuesday, Catman has a birthday. And on Friday, Tasha Purley has a birthday. So happy birthday to those people. Anniversaries this week on Thursday, Alan Spencer and Alan and Sue Spencer. Saturday, uh, Jake and Pam DeMerchant and Tammy and Dana Wright have an anniversary. So happy anniversary to those people. Sunday night, young adults ages 18 to 25 will meet at the Parsonage at 8 o'clock. Sheila's uh, group for women on Monday at 12 o'clock here at the church. On Tuesday, July 27th at 10 a.m., uh, prayer walk again will meet at the arena parking lot. Grief share is on Thursday night at 6.30. Uh, if you're interested in joining that group, uh, contact Sheila, Rebecca, or Sarah. The uh, manuscript Bible study uh, online will be on August the uh, 16th and on uh, September the 6th, so keep those dates in mind. Uh, Children's End of Summer Carnival will be August uh, the 28th, so uh, mark that on your calendar. And just a reminder, every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, there's a pre-service prayer held here at the, uh, in the family room. Uh, the uh, music uh, worship team is looking for a uh, guitar player, if any of you are interested in, uh, uh, to do that, or any other instrumentalists. So uh, please see uh, Marianne or uh, Sabrina for uh, information on that. Just a mortgage update uh, for everyone. As of July the 1st, our remaining mortgage is down to 59000 $278. So if uh, you uh, want to uh, contribute to the uh, mortgage, please uh, do so. And uh, just a note, uh, Pastor Nathan and Sabrina are going on vacation. I guess we allow them to do that. Uh, actually starting tomorrow until August the 9th. So if anyone has any uh, uh, questions, you can just contact the elders. Most of us should be still around for the summer. And uh, the children uh, can uh, go to uh, the river program at this time. And just a note from uh, Dean Butterfield, five months until Christmas. That's good. I, I wasn't even wondering, now I know the answer, so. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. I don't know about you, but I, um, I was just thinking about how next week, hopefully, we don't have to wear the masks, and then I was thinking about how many masks I have, <laughs> and I, what am I going to do with them if, if there's no, uh, no purpose, so I don't know. We'll have to find something to do. Uh, I hope everyone's doing good. We had a little, took a little trip this uh, week, uh, this weekend, and we went to Sussex. Uh, we went to the drive-in theater in Sussex, and then we drove back through uh, St. Martin's, and we stopped at the sea caves, and we saw all the things there. And one of the things that I do um, every time we go, get ready to go somewhere, is I have to take into account where are we going to eat? <laughs> what are we going to do? Now, I'm, I know you wouldn't know by looking at me, but I really enjoy a good meal. <laughs> it's one of my favorite activities. And I was thinking as we, as we get into the message today, I was just sort of asking myself and I was asking um, Kelsey and uh, some other people, what is the best meal you've ever eaten? Uh, what's, what's the best thing you've ever had? And for me, I put this picture up here because, now this isn't a picture of the meal, this is just one that I found on Google, of what it was, but the best meal I ever had was a leg of lamb that was just 
I it must have been 10 years ago at this point, but I still think about it often. Like it was so delicious that I still keep coming back to it. So I don't know what, does anybody have something that you, you just, you love? It's, your, it's, it's a meal that just has stood out to you. I know I've had a few, I asked a few people and several people, Kelsey included, said that it was a meal on a cruise ship. Uh, apparently cruises have, are, are known for really good food and I know some, that there are lots of chefs that they, that's what they do is they spend their life working on a cruise ship. I don't know what the best meal you've ever eaten is, but I know for sure, and I just, I, I just want you to kind of tuck this into the back of your mind, and you'll kind of see where we're going once we start reading the scripture. But I want you to know, I can guarantee you that if somebody offered me that meal again, I would take it. In fact, you could offer me that meal or any other food, and I would take it because it was so good. It stands out so much in my memory. It was lamb, it was cooked good, it had this sort of... Uh, I don't even know what to call it. It wasn't gravy exactly because I don't think it was thickened, but it was like a reduction that was on it, and it was just unbelievably good. And if I had the opportunity to eat that, I wouldn't say no for anything else. So I just want you to think about that in in the back of your mind. And we're going to read a passage of Scripture this morning from Ezekiel. Now, I've been sort of studying Ezekiel for the last, uh, last couple of months and I've been going through Ezekiel's life, and I have been um, looking at some of the things that he experienced and some of the things that God did through him. And uh, this morning, we're going to kind of pick it up at the beginning of Ezekiel's life, and we're just going to talk about it. Now, I put it up here. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Ezekiel, although I know it's um, maybe not a place that is commonly turned to, so maybe you don't, you know, maybe it'll take you a minute, but we've got it here anyway, Ezekiel chapter 2. And we're just going to read the first eight verses. And it says, and he, and he's talking about God, said to me, so this is Ezekiel talking, and he said to me, son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. Then the spirit entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet and I heard him who spoke to me. And he said to me, son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. For they are impudent and stubborn children. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of them of their words, or dismayed by their looks. Though they are a rebellious house, you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come together. We thank you for your word. And I pray today that as we take some time to look to your word, that our hearts would be open, that we would hear what you have to say to us today. Lord, as you encourage us, as you speak to us, as you challenge us, as you cause us to grow, as you cause us to develop, Lord, let our hearts be open to receive of you today. And we give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Ezekiel is one of... Many prophets who are called to the children of Israel, many who are told to go to the children of Israel, and as I look at the life of the children of Israel, I think honestly we all can relate to their experiences. They have moments of great obedience, and then they have moments of great failure. They have moments of great victories, and yet they also have moments of what God calls rebellion. They have moments where they are earnestly following after the things of God, and then they have moments where they struggle, where they have doubts, where they don't act in faith. They have moments where God is leading them out of Egypt, just like we talked about this morning with the kids, and then they have moments where they're throwing all their gold and silver into a pot and creating an idol to worship. They have moments of up and down, and as we read through the the history of the children of Israel as it's outlined in the Old Testament, 
we really can see a lot of parallels, I think, to our own lives. Now, maybe we don't have the drastic ups and downs that they have. Maybe you do have those drastic ups and downs. But through that all, and what I am always encouraged by, is that no matter where the children of Israel are at, whether they're in a moment of great obedience or whether they're in one of their darker days, God is still trying to work with them. He never, despite their rebellion, despite their worship of idols, despite all of the things that they do, never gives up on them. He never looks at them and says, that's too far, you've gone too, too far, you've turned away too much, you've done too much bad stuff, you've, you, you did... He never does that. Now, sometimes he has to bring correction. Sometimes he has to bring them to the right place, but he is always trying to keep the relationship with the children of Israel alive. And the role that Ezekiel is playing here is of the voice of God. He is, he is being called, he is being purposed, he's being uh, set forth for the purpose of communicating with the children of Israel. They are in a low time here. We can read through what God says in this passage and understand that they are in a time of rebellion. They're in a time where they are rebelling against God. It says in verse, I don't have my glasses on. It says in verse, I guess I don't have, oh, it doesn't have the verses there. Okay, it says, <laughs> and he said to me, son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day, for they are impudent and stubborn children. Children in rebellion. Children, the children of Israel were not doing what God wanted them to do. So he sends Ezekiel to deal with it. And I read this and it really stood out to me that God actually gives us a definition of this rebellion. He defines it. We, if, I, if I say to you the word rebellion, everyone I'm sure has a different idea of what that means. Everybody probably has something that comes to mind that when they think of rebelling or someone who is rebelling, maybe they think of someone rebelling against authority or against their parents or doing uh, against a system. Or We all have a different framework for that, but God here specifically outlines what rebellion is, and it's the very last verse. He says to Ezekiel, But you, son of man, hear when I say to you, do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. God is trying through all of scriptures to provide. From the very beginning, the Garden of Eden, to, to the very end of scripture, God is trying to provide. He's trying to provide. Now, the, the need of the provision is different from situation to situation. Sometimes it's a, a, a miraculous need. Sometimes it's an emotional need. Sometimes it's a purposeful need. Sometimes it's a very practical thing. But as we go through the Old Testament and as we see, go through all the prophets and as we go through the life of Jesus and as we see the apostles, he is constantly trying to provide. And here he says to Ezekiel, don't be rebellious like that rebellious house. Don't be rebellious like them, but open up your mouth and eat what I give you. And I think really ultimately, the most basic understanding of what it is to rebel against God is to not receive what he's giving to us. It's very simple. That's, that's, a, that's a super simple lesson, but so much of Scripture revolves around God is trying to give. He's, he's, he's giving us life. He's giving us salvation. He's giving us all of these things. And the act of rebellion comes from not receiving what he is freely giving. I wrote down some passages of scripture. I don't have them on slides today because I just jotted them down. But I wrote down some passages of scripture that I'm sure we're all familiar with when it comes to God's gifts. In James chapter 1, verse 17, 
And I think this is the first Bible verse I ever memorized. I remember being just a little boy in a Christmas concert, and I, I was in my little Christmas outfit, and I had to stand up in front of the microphone, and I had to say this passage, which I probably couldn't remember now, <laughs> but I think we all sort of recognize it. It says, every good and perfect gift comes from God, comes down from the Father. Every good and perfect gift comes from Him. Like I said, it doesn't take a lot of deep digging into scriptures to see that God is constantly providing. He's giving. He's trying to help us. He's trying to provide for us. Every good and perfect gift comes from Him. In Romans, it talks about the gifts of God, the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable, meaning He gives them, He just wants us to have them. He's not taking them back. He's giving them, just as a true gift should be. Given without expecting anything, without, but receive the gift that is given. In Matthew, Jesus talks about earthly fathers and heavenly fathers. And he talks about the difference of how an earthly father wants to do good for their children and wants to. This is Matthew chapter 7 is where Jesus talks about it. He says, your earthly fathers, if your children ask for bread, you're not going to give them a stone. You're, 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 you're going to give them what they're asking for. If you can, if you can provide, you're going to do whatever you can. How much more so does our heavenly father love us and give us good things? Peter, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, he says, each of us has been given a gift, and, and to sort of paraphrase, we should use that gift to help other people. We should use that gift to serve other people, to encourage other people. All through scriptures we see over and over again, and probably the most important scripture as it refers to giving is in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, where it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Probably the most important passage is in terms of giving and understanding how God gives and understanding what God gives is that he is giving us the gift of God is life. And we go through all of scriptures and we can see that God is constantly giving. And we go back to the story of Ezekiel and he says to Ezekiel, don't be rebellious like that rebellious house. Don't rebel like them because they're not receiving what I'm trying to to give them. But as I went through this, I saw that God was encouraging Ezekiel in a couple of different ways, and I just want to point out, just we're just going to kind of look at this in an expository way. That's where we just kind of read through and look at it, because as I said, I've, been, I've spent about two months now reading this and, and just allowing God to speak to me. This, if God is calling not receiving from him rebellion, I want to receive. I want to receive, I want to, I want to take what he's giving me. I want to take what it is that he's imparting into my life. So I'm reading through this and I start thinking, well, what is God giving to Ezekiel? How is God doing this with Ezekiel? What is he, he's, he says to Ezekiel, don't rebel, open up and eat, take what I am giving you. How is God doing that? So as he said to me, son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. Then the spirit entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet and I heard him who spoke to me. I think this is really the first part of receiving from God, and that is hearing what he has to say. We can, some, there's a song that goes like this, Open my ears, Lord. Open my ears. Let me hear what you have to say. We have all of Scripture to hear God's word. But you know, you can, people can spend lots of time reading the words and not hearing his voice. You can blindly turn to any page of your Bible and you can read what the sentence says, but I don't want to just read it, I, just don't, I don't want to just see it, I want to hear what God has to say. More than just on the surface, more than just on a basic level. And Ezekiel says, I heard him who spoke to me. I heard him. I recently, I, I might have mentioned this last time because the statistic that I heard just fascinated me. And uh, so if I said this 
the last time I spoke, um, forgive me, but I just, it's just been running through my head over and over again, and that is that humans only see and hear 3% of what is going on around them. Scientifically speaking, our brain, our eyes, the receptors in our eyes and ears can only receive 3% of what's happening. There's audio frequencies that we can't hear. I don't know if you've ever played with a dog whistle, you know, where you can blow the whistle and you can't hear anything, but your dog just loses it, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't want to be there, either runs away or tries to hide because it can hear something that you can't hear. It hears at a frequency that you can't hear, but that, the truth is there's hundreds of frequencies going through the air right now that we can't hear. We're not tuned into them, right? We don't, we're, we're not receiving them. We don't have the right thing. When I was a kid, we used to have an antenna up on the roof. Now, of course, with, especially with the internet, uh, most of what we do is by streaming. Some of what we do is by satellite. But when I was a kid, we had one of those big antennas that we, was mounted on the roof, and there was a cord that came down. And sometimes I would want to watch a television channel that the reception wasn't very good on, so I would have to kind of wiggle the cord around and hope that somehow... I would get reception. There's a lot of signals going on. There's a lot of voices going on. There's a lot of things happening around us that we don't hear or that we don't see because we're not tuned in accurately. Ezekiel here is saying, I was tuned in. I heard him who spoke to me. I think that's probably a great prayer for us to pray God, let me hear what you're saying. Let me hear what you're saying. I have no doubt that you're speaking. We have your word. We have preachers and teachers. We have books. We have pastors. We have encouraging friends. We have family members. We have people who are speaking. Lord, let me hear what you are speaking. And I think the flip side of that is also, Lord, help me not to pay so much attention to what is not you to what's not being said, to, to, to people I shouldn't be listening to, to voices that I shouldn't be hearing. I heard him who spoke to me, and he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day, for they are impudent and stubborn children. Then God says this, I am sending you to them. God speaks, but he doesn't just speak idly, and he doesn't just speak in metaphors, and he doesn't just speak in things that we can't understand, but I truly believe that God will speak to us in very practical, real-life ways. God speaking to Ezekiel doesn't say some sort of super spiritual, out-in-the-clouds sort of sentence. He says, I'm sending you to them. That's what, that's what I'm doing. I'm sending you to them. You're going to go and you're going to speak to them. And he gives him a mission and he gives him this purpose. And, and Ezekiel isn't confused by the purpose because he knows who was speaking to him. He knows whose voice it was. And he says, I am sending you to them. See, if Ezekiel had any confusion, if he wasn't sure at all, he wouldn't have done it. Because what was the message? You're rebelling against God. You need to turn back. You need to turn back towards God. You need to turn your life back towards him. And if if Ezekiel wasn't sure that it was God speaking, he surely wasn't going to stand before a whole nation and call them rebellious. But he knew that it was God. And he knew that God was sending him to them. I believe very fully that all of us have a purpose. It's different between all of us. It's different for all of us. Situations are different. Impacts are different. Our circles are different. The the ability to lead and influence is different for all of us, and maybe it's on a different scale, or maybe it's in a different situation, but I believe that this is God telling Ezekiel, I have a purpose for your life, And, and just as a note of encouragement today, I believe God has a purpose for your life. And God speaks to him, And the way that he knew it was God is he heard, he listened. I think a lot of times the trouble that we have is not 
that God is not speaking to us, but it's that we're not really hearing him because when we hear him, he leads us. And beyond that, he says this. I've got these things highlighted. He says, I'm sending you to them, and you shall say to them. Thus saith the Lord God, you shall say to them. He's not just telling Ezekiel, you're going to go, but he's also saying, and this is what I want you to say. This is how I want, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to relay to them. This is what I want your words to be. He actually goes on to say just a a, a little further. um, I don't know if we can go to the next one. Yeah, you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse, but I want you to speak my words to them. I read this a couple of times. He says it uh, earlier. Uh, As for them, whether they hear, whether they refuse, no, you can go to the next one. Yeah, right at the top. You see, as for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. And then you can skip down a little lower. It says, you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse. And I've I've gone through this. I've talked to a couple of different pastors that I know about it. I've talked to some people. I've asked some opinions because this is an amazing thing that God is doing for Ezekiel. God is saying, I want you to go to the people. I want you to speak my words to them. I want you to speak on my behalf. I want you to to tell them to come back to me. I want you to tell them to come back and and to to worship me again and to, to serve me again and to love me again. And I want you to tell them to come back. But whether they listen or whether they refuse, that's not up to you. I want you to go and do it. They might not hear you. They might not receive you. They might not receive what you have to say, but I want you to be obedient to this. And I was thinking a little bit, now we're in the middle of, well, just the start of the Olympics. Now, I've been here long enough, you probably all know, I just, I love sports. Um, The only sport I don't really watch is hockey, because I don't know how to skate, and I don't understand what's going on. Uh, But most sports, especially if there's a ball, I love... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I, I like all sorts of competitions, and I even like hockey when it gets to the Olympics because I, then I know who to cheer for, which is Team Canada. Um, but beyond that, I'm kind of lost. But the Olympics are happening. And as with all sports, it sort of happens that, like it's happening for Ezekiel here. I've coached a few different teams, a couple of uh, boys' basketball teams, a couple of girls' basketball teams. And, you know, I've learned that I can't force anyone to win. I can't. Because there's too many variables. There's too many things going on. There's, there's referees and there's another team and someone might get hurt and someone might, this might happen or, or, or something. You can't control the outcome. But what you can do is prepare and do the best to the best of your ability. So when I coach basketball, I coach the girls' basketball team, I'm not saying we have to win. I'm saying let's do the best that we can. We want to win. We want to. But we can't control, always control the outcomes. And here Ezekiel's in a situation where he can't control the outcome. The children of Israel are rebelling against God. They're not receiving the things of God. They might not receive the prophet when he comes, but God is saying go and do it anyway. Whether they receive it or whether they turn you away, be faithful. And it's a little bit like I would say to my kids, whether we win or whether we lose, I want you to play hard. I want you to play to the best of your ability. I want you to do the best that you can. And whether we win or lose, I'm going to be proud if we do our best. I'm going to be proud if we work hard. I'm going to be proud if we don't give up. I'm going to be proud if we play to the final buzzer. God here is sending Ezekiel, but he's giving him this, I think it's really strength that comes from this. That our relationship with God isn't dependent on whether other people get it, whether other people respond, whether other people react the way we want them to, whether other people react. And our mission that God sends us on is not just about whether people receive, but it's about us being obedient to him. Twice God says this. As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, 
They are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. And then he says, you will speak my words to them, whether they hear them or whether they refuse. Truthfully, we all understand this. We, we can't control how other people will react. But we control what we do. God is telling Ezekiel, be faithful. Do what I'm calling you to do. Other people might not get it. The, the, the children of Israel might not hear you. They might not receive it. They might refuse it. Still be faithful. Still be faithful. Because it's not all about them. It's not all about results. It's about doing what you're called to do, doing what you're asked to do. It's nice to know that God is concerned about us, not just what we can do. This is a message that I think is sometimes lost in our churches sometimes because we so desperately want people to be involved. We want volunteers and we want people to help and and this isn't negating that, we want that. We want people to be involved. But God isn't so concerned with what we can do as much as he is concerned about who we are. He's not so concerned with what Ezekiel can do for him as he is with having this relationship with Ezekiel himself. He's already spoke to him, Ezekiel's listening. They've got this relationship that's building. They've got this relationship that's growing. And God is saying, I want you to go and do this, but whether they hear, whether they refuse, I just want you to be obedient because it's not about what you can do for me. God wants to reach the children of Israel, but he also cares about Ezekiel as a person. And he cares about each of us as a person. And yes, I believe God has a purpose and has a plan for each of us, but he also cares about you for who you are. He cares about what you're dealing with. He cares about what you're going through. He cares about what's happening in your life. He's not just trying to use you as a tool, but he loves you. And he wants to give you purpose and he wants to use you for a purpose, but ultimately he wants to have that relationship with you. And that's what he says to Ezekiel. He encourages them, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. There are briars and thorns that they're with you, and, and you might dwell among scorpions, but don't be afraid of their words. Don't be dismayed. Speak my words. Speak my words. And then he finishes with this statement, which is kind of where we started. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Receive of what I'm giving you. Don't be like them. Don't don't throw away the meal. Receive it. Eat it. Partake of it. And that led me back to this idea of the best thing I have ever eaten. This leg of lamb. Now I've had a lot of good things, but it's just one of the things. I'm sure if I Maybe tomorrow I'd think of something different. But it was so good. I had no, I would, if somebody offered it to me, there is nothing that I would do. Nothing that, I I wouldn't choose anything else over it because I know how good it is. Open your mouth and eat what I give you, what I provide for you. We just went through a couple of, scriptures and there's many more talking about the gifts that God gives us and how good they are and how fulfilling they are and how amazing they are and when you have received from God when you've received of the salvation that he provides and you've received of the joy that he provides and you've received the the spirit of God that gives strength in our life and when we receive these things from him nothing else will compare Nothing else will live up to it. There's nothing else. You couldn't couldn't give me something else. If I had the opportunity to eat that leg of lamb and you offered me a hot dog, sorry, I'm not eating the hot dog. I'm not going to eat something that isn't as good. And God here is talking about rebellion and he's talking to Ezekiel and he's saying, don't settle for something less than what I have for you. 
We can go through scriptures and see that God has this fullness. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it abundantly, have it full, have it, have it just the fullness of life, feel, feeling satisfied, feeling full, in spiritually feeling connected to God and, and living on purpose and living with purpose and, and being full in life. That, that's God. That's, Jesus says, I've come that you can have that kind of fullness of life. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. It's really easy if you like it. Uh, when the kids were little, there was a couple of times where I tried to feed them things that they didn't want. They'd spit it out or they'd take a bite and then they'd, you know, especially little babies when you have to feed them with a the spoon, they just, they, they didn't want it. They'd turn. I remember Nevaeh. Say hi, Nevaeh. She's waving. <laughs> they told me they really like when I point them out and get them to do something like that, so. <laughs> oh wait you don't don't like that never mind <laughs> they don't like when I do that um I remember trying to feed her things and having her turn her face and it's smearing all over turn her face away so she wouldn't eat it she didn't want to eat that I want to get to the point where when God is feeding me I'm opening my mouth to receive but when this world and, and the things of life are trying to, I'm turning my face away. I don't want that. I don't want the hot dog. Give me the lamb. <laughs> I don't want that. Now, I like hot dogs. I had three yesterday, okay? I actually had four yesterday. <laughs> I'm not saying anything against hot dogs. I'm just saying when God feeds us, oh, he gives us the best gifts, doesn't he? When we have that fullness of a relationship with him, nothing else compares to it. Nothing else matches up to it. And God is here talking about rebellion, and he's saying, receive, eat the thing that I'm giving you. And as we go through scripture over and over and over again, God is trying to provide. He's giving. He gives great gifts. He gives fullness. He gives us salvation. He gives us hope. He gives us joy. He gives us victory. He gives us these things, and he wants us to receive. I've been going through Ezekiel. I feel like I could go, I mean, I went through a couple of pages. I have about seven pages of notes, just things that Ezekiel is experiencing in this moment, in the way that God is using Ezekiel, in the way that God is ministering to him, but all of it comes down to this passage, open up your mouth and eat what I give you. Now, I knew someone one time that they had a tendency to give weird things for meals. I, it was a farmer that I worked for one time, and it was his wife. And she, uh, this, this was a, a while ago, not all that long ago, but long ago enough that the farmer's wife came at lunchtime and gave meals to the people who were working on the farm. I don't know that that happens as often anymore, but it did happen when I was uh, younger. I was working on a farm, but she meant well, <laughs> but she didn't always give the best food. She didn't always provide the best meals. And one day she came and she brought us a sandwich and the sandwich, and I cannot believe that this happened, but I know that it's true because I have uh, uh, my friends, uh, it was his parents' farm, he was there with me. She gave us sandwiches, which was white bread uh, with butter on both sides, raw onions, and a slice of oranges. So, if you want to go home and try it, go ahead. <laughs> I didn't try it. <laughs> but God gives us good things. And when we know that it's someone who's going to give us good things, we can receive it. I would, if she tried to serve me something, I, I probably wouldn't receive it. But Kelsey... If she just, she could show up with anything on a fork and she would just say, taste this. And I'd, I'd open my mouth, I'd say, okay, I'll taste it. Because she's a good cook and she makes good things, so I'm going to receive because it's good. And when we know how good the gifts of God are, when we've received them, when we've experienced them, and he's trying to feed us, he's trying to give to us, we can open our mouth and receive. We have a leg up on Ezekiel. Because we have the rest of scriptures, we have all of the New Testament, we have all of the teachings of Jesus, we see all of the things that God has for us, the life that he has for us, the history, the testimonies. 
people around us that have received from God, and we can say, God, I want to receive from you. Whatever it is, whatever you've got, I want. Whatever you're going to feed me, God, I want to receive it. I'm not going to turn away. I'm not going to push you away. I'm going to receive it. I found it so interesting that that was how God here is defining this rebellion of the house of Israel. That he was defining it as not receiving what he was giving. Because again, we all think of rebellion in different ways. You know, maybe we think of it as someone going on some sort of wild rebellious streak or we go on it as someone, you know, we, we all think of that in different ways. But here God is very simply saying, not receiving what I am giving, I want to receive everything. Anything he wants to give me, God, I receive it. I receive it. And I want to encourage you to kind of help, help you receive the same way or get your mind thinking the same way. God, whatever you have for me, I want to receive it. Let's stand together today and we'll pray. Gracious Lord, And Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your love. We're thankful for your grace. We're thankful for your mercy. Lord, we're thankful for all that you give, even your own life given for us. Lord, help us to not be rebellious, but help us to receive what you are freely giving. Help us to open up and eat what you are providing for us. Help us to accept these amazing gifts that you've given to us. Lord, your love and your grace and your mercy, your power, your forgiveness, your hope, your joy. Lord, these things are so good. Let us receive them from you. Lord, we know that there's other competing voices in the world. There's other things that would take our time or would take our focus or would take our attention, Lord, but help us to hear what you have to say and help us to receive what it is that you are giving to us. God, I thank you again for your word today, and I thank you for your grace, and I thank you that you love us so much. Help this to not just be a thing that we hear in our brains, but help us to hear it with our hearts, to hear what you have to say, and to receive what you are giving. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. morning. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Lots to be thankful for, but definitely lots to pray for, lots of need, lots of people. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for this day, for this opportunity we can come and just to fellowship with one another, Lord, to, to bring our needs, to bring our cares before you, to learn from you, Lord, word from, learn from your word, and we just thank you, Father, that we can do this freely and without, uh, without judgment. We thank you, Lord, that we know whatever we receive from you is the best thing for us. And we, we know and we can trust that and give you thanks. This morning, Father, we pray for some people who are sick. We remember uh, Jen Hansen in Calgary. Um, even though she's getting some good reports, we'll be with her. We remember Julie Brayson's son, Joe. Can you be with Mary Doughty? And Sandy Crab, Lord, watch over each of them, be with them in their situations. May they know your presence. Father, uh, we remember those who are um, recovering. We think of uh, John Everett doing well, continuing to do well. Father, we thank you that uh, Lee Hoyt and Mariah Fournier are home, recovering from surgeries this past week, and are doing well. Be with them as they recover. Just draw close to them. Also for Aaron Demery uh, at the manor, continue to be with her. Father, we just pray those who are waiting for surgery that you would open up doors there. Uh, just be with them, keep them um, safe and healthy until they're able to do so. Uh, continue to be with Tammy Bragdon and her health uh, and her different parts of her family. Just watch over all of them. Father, we just pray for those who are battling cancer. Stella McLaughlin, Marlene's foster aunt Pam, Terry Everett's brother-in-law Brent, Tammy Wright's sister uh, Carlene, Sabrina's Aunt Gloria. Father, we just pray for all these and just that, that fight that they uh, are going through.
in this terrible situation. We just pray, Father, that they would um, seek you, would seek peace through you, Father. Surround them with love through their families, we pray. Father, we pray for all those in the Victoria Glen Manor and the villa, those who are at home, all those who are unable to get out like the rest of us. We just uh, bring them before you and uh, just be with them. And Lord, we uh, look forward to when things can go uh, uh, green and freely and a little more uh, access that uh, it would allow these people to have access to uh, others outside the, of these situations and they would be able to meet and uh, fellowship and just uh, have their spirits lifted. Father, we pray for the COVID situation ongoing and we thank you, Father, for uh, the way the vaccinations have been going well in our province. We Look forward to going green and opening up freely more, Father, and it allows families, Father, to reunite. And uh, uh, we just pray for that uh, we continue in that direction and that you would uh, draw communities and families closer. We pray for all those, Father, those for, for the cases, though, that are rising in, in other places are coming back a little bit, that you would continue to keep that at bay, that you would help people to understand what they need to do to make sure that doesn't, uh, we don't go backwards, but continue to move forwards. Father, pray for anyone who may be grieving. Just comfort them and watch over them. Anyone that our Grief Share group deals with, and we thank you for them that they're able to uh, help these people through this process. Father, we pray for all the different church ministries. We pray for um, Nathan and Sabrina and Sheila and Andrew, for their leadership, for their love for you and their call. And we thank you for each one of them. Pray for all those who serve in all the different ministries of our church. Thank you for them. We pray, Father, for all those who are having a birthday and anniversary this coming week, that you would bless them. Father, remember our camp this summer, and things are going well, and we just continue to pray that you keep everyone safe there. And pray, Father, that your spirit would be moving among the kids, among the campers. Guide and direct everyone there. Father, we pray for the prayer walk. Uh, that's been going on through the through the community and as uh, Nathan and Sheila lead that just uh, pray that um, your spirit would be among those who meet as we lift up the different um, different communities the different organizations in our community father and we just pray that um, you continue to be with that little uh, ministry that started and we look forward to that Father, we pray for the gradual opening up the, um, in our province and especially how that will affect organizations and as our ministry here at our church. And we look forward to the possibilities as we move forward. We've seen that a little bit with VBS this summer and the success. And, and we are excited, Father, for um, church to get back to maybe the way it's been and even probably even better, Lord. And we pray that as uh, even though it's been a great to have people uh, join us online. We just pray that you would speak to hearts, that you would challenge people to get back into the church, to to gather, to to understand it's so important to be with each other and among each other. And Father, we just look forward to that progress. Father, around the world, we just uh, continue to pray for uh, the challenges of racism and prejudices. We pray, Father, that people would understand they need to show your love and how you have accepted everyone and anyone. We pray for all the inequality and how, how that's uh, going on unfairly. And we know that we stand before you uh, equal, Father. You see us all as your children and you love us all and help people to see that. Father, we pray for violence and trauma that goes on in our world and we just pray for peace, that people would seek your, your will, would seek you and understand, Father, that they need, need you. And Father, we pray for all those who may be traveling this summer and undertake for everyone, keep everyone safe as they do so, able to get out a little bit more this summer and uh, help them to enjoy uh, our province and our country. Uh, be with uh, Pastor Nathan and Sabrina as they go on their vacation. Keep them safe, watch over them, help them to enjoy their time off and to recuperate and be refreshed. And Father, now we just uh, leave all this in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's stand to sing our last song. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the king of kings. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were. Now you're <coughs> still enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out. We join them as we sing glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. <coughs> Creator God, you gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name all my days, all my days. Let my whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. As, a ben as our benediction this morning, uh, I want to remind us of what pa Pastor Andrew uh, said. He said, we all have moments of victory and failure, obedience and rebellion. And so as we go this week, I want us to hear the words that God spoke to Ezekiel. He says, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious people. God is speaking, and he is speaking all of the time around us. He speaks through encouraging friends, through his word, through pastors, and if we allow him, through us as well. May you receive this week the good gifts that God is giving you by hearing his voice. Amen.